I'm, I'm an American. Uh, I believe in free speech, and I'll exercise it around here. And uh, you might as well come out and listen. Uh, you stay home and watch something dull like television. You're not going to hear what you're going to hear anyway. The last place in this world where you can hear the truth now is getting to be little old buildings like this. You drive, you drive down this alley here, the street, it's just a little building sitting over here. You wouldn't think anything was going on in a little building like this. Listen, man, there'll be things said here in the next two or three days. You wouldn't get in television. You watch that boob tube for 35 years. Yeah. Folks talk about Phil Donahue facing the issues. Ah, oh, that little sissy, your foot. Yeah. Well, that kid, if I got the program like that, I'd blow every tube in that set, boy, in five yeah. seconds. You folks think you're getting the real thing, you know. Tell them like it is. They don't tell them like it is. They, don't tell, they call them gays, you know. They call them queers. I mean, you're not going to get it the way it is. They say premarital sex. We say fornication. They talk about adult consent. We say adultery. We're the plain talkers. Not your crowd. Now, uh, if you think I'm kidding, you stick around tonight, tomorrow night, and Sunday, and I'll... You'll see what you'll see. I mean, uh, I'm I'm a right winger, brother. I I, I think Archie Bunker's a communist. <laughs> All right, if you have a Bible tonight, let's turn to um, Proverbs fourteen fourteen. I was told when I came out here, don't tell any jokes about the freeway or the smog. <laughs> And I told them, no, I wouldn't have uh, been there. I didn't even see the freeway. And they said, why not? I said, because of the smog. <laughs> <laughs> they say out in California, the mothers say, honey, drink your milk before it gets dirty. <laughs> All right, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 14. Proverbs 14, verse 14. Now, this uh, passage here um, brings about, brings before your view, a term that you've heard all your life probably as a Christian, and if you haven't heard it, you will before very long, and this term is a very common term used in America, it's backslider. Proverbs 14, 14 says, the backslider in heart should be filled with his ways. And when we use the term, uh, we understand it means a Christian is out of fellowship with God. Now, it's an Old Testament term, it's not a New Testament term. And sometimes we've got to be more careful for terminology. Sometimes we get clumsy with our terminology, and we give impressions that aren't true. For example, a lot of people think a backslider is a fellow got saved, and then he got lost. Well, that isn't true. Uh, the term the term backslider is not even in the New Testament. It's in the Old Testament. If you have a Bible there, turn to Jeremiah 2. Jeremiah 2, and look at it again. In Jeremiah 2, that thing occurs about five times in Jeremiah 2. And all those cases there where it occurs in Jeremiah chapter 2 is talking about a nation. Jeremiah chapter 2. Look at verse 11, 12, 14, and 22. 11, 12, 14, and 22. And notice in all those cases he's talking about a nation. And he called this nation uh, backsliding Israel. So the term is an Old Testament term. And when I use the term, I'm never using it in the sense of somebody who uh, got saved and got lost. I'm not using it in that sense. I'm using it in the sense of a person who was in fellowship with the Lord and then got out of fellowship with the Lord. And that's how we use the term when we talk about a backslider. Uh, if you're saved, there may be some things that are hard to understand, hard to deal with. But there's one thing that's clear. If you're born again, you can't be unborn again. If you're saved, you're going to heaven. You say, what if? Well, then Lord may have to kick you all the way. Some Christians go first class, some second, some third class. But God is going to get you home one way or another. And if you're saved, you're going to go. And some of his words seem hard to believe sometimes. Yes, if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, knows all things. And the Lord knows whether you're not you're saved. The average Baptist in America today is so backslidden that you have to backslide to have fellowship with him. But if you're saved, you're going to heaven. You're not going to lose it. One time a charismatic said to Jack Kyle, they said, uh, well, if you get to heaven before I do, tell my friends I'm coming too. And Brother Kyle said, no, I wouldn't dare do that because uh, then you might lose it and then I'd get convicted of lying and get kicked out of heaven. <laughs> now, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. 
They made a film one time up at Hyle Anderson and Soul Winning and had a bunch of people act out the parts, which is a good thing. It was instructive. And uh, they had a fellow come around and knock at a door. The guy come to the door and the fellow at the door asked him, are you saved? And to go along with the part, the fellow opens the door has to say, no, I'm not. And, uh, of course, it has to be Christians acting out all the parts in the film, you know, made there at the school. And they pull that thing off, and the guy knocked at the door, and the camera roared. And the kid opened the door, and the guy says, you say, and the fellow stood there for a minute. And then he said, yes. <laughs> and they said, cut, and had to take the thing over. And then he got there the second time, he got there the second time, the guy said, you say it, the guy turned red in the face and said, yes. And they cut again, and they said, you've got to tell him, no, you're not saved, we're making a film. And he said, I'm not going to get lost again for anybody. <laughs> and, and if you've been born again, and you've been trusted the precious blood of Jesus Christ to save you, God's going to get you home to heaven. And it's not on your merit. It's not on your merit, it'll be on his merit. A uh, fellow said to me one time, he said, you ever doubt your salvation? I said, yeah, a couple times. And he said, how long? I said, oh, five or six seconds, something like that. And he said, well, how'd you get the victory? Well, where I get the victory is I don't argue with the devil. You see, some of you Christians waste your time fooling around. The devil comes you and gets you doubt your salvation. You begin to point out what you did that you did, you're no longer doing or what you're getting ready to do or how you felt when you trusted Christ or some experience you went through. I never go into that. The devil comes around to me and says, you're lost. I say, okay, you are. I am lost. Well, leave me alone. Let me enjoy myself. <laughs> I mean, yeah, man. I mean, I am trusting Christ to get me to heaven. If that won't get me to heaven, what will get me to heaven? Nothing. So that's the trouble. The devil gets you in a dialogue. And then you start thinking, well, maybe there's something I can do. Save yourself the time, man. There's nothing you can do to start with. So save yourself the trouble. And the devil starts, listen, if, if I can go to hell trusting the blood of Jesus Christ, everybody in this world is going to hell, everybody in the universe is going to hell, and I did all I could do anyway. I couldn't do anything better than trust the blood of Jesus Christ. So why worry about it? Folks always get worried about those kind of things. Now, God's going to get you home one way or another. And yet, when we talk about backsliding, we know what we're talking about. Christians worry about the wrong stuff. They worry about going to hell. That's the one thing you don't have to worry about. Now, there's plenty else you've got to worry about. The Bible says, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God that worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. So there's something you have to worry about. There's plenty you've got to worry about in this life before you go home to heaven. But uh, going to hell isn't one of them. That isn't one of them. You have, if you're saved, you have inside you a secret indestructible life. You have a new man. Paul says, Though the outward man perishes, the inward man is a new day by day. And you have in you a man who is born again, and from day to day, no matter what kind of condition goes on elsewhere in your body and in your soul, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is still there, and someday he'll bust through and turn you into a new man. Yeah. Now, you have a, also within you uh, an old nature, and like the old song says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. Uh, when you're prone to do something, you lie down flat, you lean that way. And the old song you sing says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. And then it says, uh, praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. So though, although we're saved, and we are saved, we have a new man, new nature within us, and we do, we have also within us uh, an old nature. That old nature resents God, doesn't love God. Did you know after you're saved, and I know how most of you probably, when you got saved, if you got saved late in life, uh, people sometimes they get saved when they're so young, it wasn't too clear to them. But you know, when you get saved late in life, uh, you remember it pretty well. And when you get saved, uh, for a while there, you think that uh, everything's just going to be fine, all your problems are over. And sometimes your problems just start. <laughs> you see, when you get saved, that solves all your problems after death. But that don't solve all your problems here. Sometimes they just begin about long about then. And then after you get saved, you go along there for a while, and then all of a sudden some horrible thing pops up in your life, and you say, oh my God, I couldn't do that and be saved. Now, that's the common experience. You're getting kind of quiet on me, which means you know exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> and listen, if you're saved, you see that old man, and you rise up and scare you to death. 
There is with every believer, not only an indestructible nature, a new man that loves God, there is never believe what old Paul says, O wretched man that I am. He says, I myself serve the law of sin. Paul had a man in him that didn't love God, didn't love the law of God, didn't love God. That's a terrible thing to think about. In me, inside my body, dwells a man that doesn't like God. He has no use for God. You say in you, yeah, in me. You say it's hard to believe. It isn't hard to believe when God crosses you. No trouble out of Christians today. The Lord does never cross them real good. Did you ever have your mind just made up to go along this way and then God just did something that just ruined the whole thing and you couldn't figure out why? That's when the test comes. That's when the test comes. That's when you find that old man rising up in there and saying, Lord, now, if you know all the facts like I know them, you wouldn't have handled it that way. <laughs> <laughs> now, of course, you wouldn't say that. See, I'd say it, but you would and I'd say it because I know it's so. I've seen that thing inside myself. You have that old nature. You have inside there a secret, perpetual departing from God. Prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. It's like inside of a tree rotting out. Like when these redwoods up here for years and years, standing up there braving the storms and the rain and the avalanches and the forest fire, and then one day it just topples over and hits the ground. And somebody said, what is it? Oh, some little old bug in there working inside, inside that thing. Christians have within them a, a, a decay there. You take a, a, any fellow that's an amateur karate can put on a demonstration by chopping a rotten log and do with his hand. The thing will just fall apart on you. Did you ever, did you ever climb trees and step on a limb that was rotten inside? You know, kids, that, kids these days, they don't do what I did when I was a boy. When I was a boy, we were outdoors all day long. You couldn't get us in for nothing. And it was in Kansas. I mean, it was 20 below sometimes, 10 below that kind of thing. You still couldn't keep us indoors. And I learned a lot about tree climbing when I was a boy. We always climbing trees. And I learned a great lesson in life. Don't ever let go of one limb till you're sure the next one can hold you. <laughs> now, that, that lesson has stuck with me through the years. <laughs> I mean, twice I've come out of trees 15 to 20 feet high. They hit the ground. I mean, flat, man, just flat. And just lie there just purple, couldn't breathe, couldn't get a breath of air. If you, if you never had that, you missed a blessing, brother. And running, I remember one night, one night we were stealing something. My lungs were bad days back in those days. Running from the cops. To this day, a siren curdles my blood. Just, I mean, I, I've been really bad trouble. that hadn't caught me anyway. <laughs> Any real bad trouble for years and years and years, you know. But that, that siren, it just, when I was 15, 16, 17, 18, it was through the alleys and over the fences and behind the doors and up to the fire escapes and out to the back end of those birds chasing I remember one night me and the kid were running from something and they were coming after us and we went through two backyards and that kid got to crawl on a picket fence and they got him and they got me but I hit a clothesline going through the backyard. And you never had a blessing you hit a clothesline on as hard as you can right in the neck <laughs> or a rake, a rake's good. You know, my hand will come up. And I went to sit that thing and hit that clothesline on my feet when I was mad. Flap, I hit the ground. And I'm telling you, those fellows, they went by within 10 feet of me. I could have touched them with a broom hammer and they never heard me because I couldn't make a sound. <laughs> I'm just lying out. <laughs> and I learned, like I say, in climbing those trees and going up down those trees that you don't get on the next limb until the one that's, uh, that's uh, under you makes Sure, it's solid. You don't let go of that thing, or the next one will hold you up. Now, you have in you a perpetual rottenness, a thing that falls apart, a thing that he's constant tending to. Uh, one of those laws of thermodynamics, I'll be for the second law, something about the law of entropy. States in so many words, well, put it the way Murphy puts it. <laughs> Murphy's laws are better anyway. Everything falls apart. That's the truth. <laughs> Your watch doesn't run up, it runs down. I don't see anybody who has a used car can believe in evolution. And, and did you know? Did you know? Did you know that you that you life as a Christian like that, unless you pour something in from the outside into you continually to revive that thing and keep it going, it just falls apart. That's all it is. You just keep staying away from the church and keep staying away from the Bible and keep staying away from Christian fellowship and let your prayer life go to pieces, and let your Bible even go to pieces, you'll go to pieces. I well, said one time, he said, a, a Bible that's come apart usually belongs to a Christian who hasn't come apart. 
Lester Roloff used to say, uh, every Christian needs to learn how to come apart, you know, or, or he said he'll come apart. I don't know how you happen to mention Roloff and Brother Gray and me in the same breath, but those are two guys that I've always thought just like those two fellows think. You never have met three more different fellows in all your life than me and Gray and Roloff. We think it's exactly the same. I don't, I don't think there's one point on that Roloff ever taught on that I ever disagreed with. We just, we just think a lot, but we're different. You take those kind of things, Roloff says you better cu- come apart and rest once in a while or you come apart. That H.E.W. and that bunch like to throw him apart before he died. I was talking with the associate pastor about two weeks ago. The associate pastor dropped by Pensacola and came and talked a while. I want to get some details right, make sure I had him right about his death, but I've been passed on others. And that associate pastor of that church out there said to me, he said, uh, would you tell me something? I said, maybe. He said, well, tell me, he said, oh, we can't figure it out, or I haven't got it figured out. Why do you think the Lord took him? Well, I've got all answers. I'm probably going to guess. I'd guess that uh, bunch out in Texas uh, getting as corrupt as they are politically. I guess in maybe about a year or so, they probably closed that place down. The Lord didn't want to him live him to see it. Break his heart, break his heart again. I could be wrong, probably something like that. Now, you have in you a life that has to be nurtured, has to be cared for and kept and maintained. And if you don't, free country, help yourself. You want to mess it up, it's your life, mess it. But you'll mess it. You have in with you the capability of doing everything that you ever heard of on the say people do. You say, oh, not me, brother, up on your head. Don't, don't kid me. Don't kid me. I, I am up to here with these good, godly, qualified, dedicated, accredited people. I do that bunch of stuff shirts for 30 years. And let me tell you something, I know the fellow that quit his smoking and quit his drinking and quit supporting the evangelicals and lie like a Persian rug for a buck. <laughs> Folks, so if a man has said he couldn't do this or that, I'm here to tell you that I have known Christians, Christians, to do everything I ever heard of them to say people do. I think maybe with, a, with the exception, maybe of, a, of torturing somebody to do that, maybe without one exception. But that'd be the only exception. I know where some Christians are right now, I'm in the slammer for offenses that you wouldn't think a saved person could be guilty of. But I know those guys, and they just say some of you are. You know what they did? They just let that book go, and let the prayer closet go, and let the church go, and they just went right back like a, like a hog, back to the wallow, like a dog, back to the vomit. Now, we're prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I hate to make that confession, but I better make it. It's an honest confession. I better make it. I have within me something that wants to depart from God, that doesn't want anything to do with God. And it's a, it's a terrible thing when you think about it, and I'm going to amplify the horror of it. We're, we're prone to wander from God in spite of a number of things. First of all, in spite of displays of grace. But I don't mean this. I don't mean by grace you say through faith, not, not of yourself, the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about grace like uh, in Hebrews, where he said, Let us come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain uh, mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, grace was quite a lady, and she comes in a number of sizes. Sometimes uh, when Paul talking about grace, he talking about the grace of giving. Sometimes talking about, Paul talking about grace, talking about the means of salvation. Sometimes he talking about grace, he talking about getting enough supply to get something done he ought to get done. And you take... When you got saved, got born again, you were saved by grace through faith. But since that time, if you told the truth about it, and some of you might not tell the truth about it, but if you told the truth about it, you'd have to admit there have been times when God gave you a break you didn't deserve. Amen. Now, come, come, brethren. I mean, if, uh, if every Christian American knew everything about you that God knows about you, they covered up graciously for you, wouldn't you be in some kind of a pickle? In the truth of the matter, since you've been saved, in the truth of the matter, a couple of times, the Lord kind of just, uh, just kind of a little cover up for you, a little help for you that, uh, uh, that you couldn't have managed by yourself. Yes, I think so. I think that's probably right. <laughs> now, in spite of displays of grace, we're prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Wouldn't you think if God had been that good to somebody, they'd appreciate it and they'd show their appreciation? 
Would you think if God been that good to somebody, they wouldn't uh, backslide on him, wouldn't turn the back on him, wouldn't speak hardly of him and hardly of his people and harshly of his ways of dealings, but we're prone to backsliding. And in spite of tenderness of instruction, by tenderness of instruction, I'm referring to the fact that God doesn't deal with us the way he deals with a lot, dealt with a lot of people in the Bible. Tell me something, if God dealt with you like he dealt with Ananias, wouldn't you be in a pickle? Tell me, Ananias, you saw the ground for so much, yea, for so much, flop over it goes. <laughs> Why, you know, God killed that fellow for trying to pretend to be more spiritual than what he was. I mean, the Lord didn't kill that fellow, you know, because he didn't tie. That wasn't it. He said, well, you had the stuff that was yours. You could have done whatever you wanted to do it with it. He said, God killed that fellow because he and his wife trying to put on a show and they're trying to act more spiritual than what they were. Now, if God killed everybody in America who was putting on that act, you'd have so many corpses you couldn't touch their ground from here to L.A. I mean, all this PTL stuff. PTL, pulling the leg, you know. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Bless you, Jesus. For praise the Lord. For glory to God for her. Oh, aren't you spiritual? Aren't you spiritual? I have one of those people come to me one time, you know, and I, I'm, I've, I've been guilty of a lot of things, but being a gentleman isn't one of them. <laughs> and, 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 and this lady came up to me. She took my hand after service one night, and she said, Oh, Brother Ruckman, she said, I know you don't understand, but we're just praying for you that God will give you the gift and just pour out his sweet spirit of love upon you. Oh, I know you don't understand, Brother Ruckman, but we just love you, Lord, we pray that when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll just talk in tongues and, Oh, the love of God will just fill your heart, and you'll just realize it. Oh, boy, boy. I held her hand real tight, but she couldn't get away for about a minute. And then I bent over and I said, well, thank you, sister. I certainly appreciate that. I said, I'm praying for you. And I said, I just want to thank God that you got the least gift that God can give a carnal believer. And I'm praying for you, God, to give you a decent gift someday like he did the rest of us. So I thank you. And I'll say, oh, man, she, she just turned all colors the rainbow, man. She lost all her sweet piety in just about two minutes. Oh, some of the brethren are great fakers. So pious. One little word just turn him inside out. Try Ruckman on some of it. <laughs> I if I'm talking about a big spirit field, you say one man's name and the kid has an apoplectic fit. <laughs> Why, the little sport, I ought to have his bitches whipped. <laughs> idea of a grown man having a spasm over one knee. Yo, sissy, suck your bottle. <laughs> amen, amen, amen. Stuff. Folks don't folks don't say amen to me, I amen myself, brother. All, all this stuff. That isn't a spiritual giant. That's a brownie, that's a girl scout, boy. All this stuff, all this stuff. Now in spite of tenderness of instruction, and God's been mighty gentle with us. God hasn't killed us for being more pious than what we were. And listen, if God treated us like he did, I was a, wouldn't we be in a mess? As he put forth his hand to hold up the ark, he wanted to help God. He was trying to serve God. He had God honor in mind, and God's honor was at stake, and he was trying to help God out. You know what he got for his trouble? About 220 volts. I mean, the Lord decked him right in the spot, man. May he thought a way to treat somebody when they're trying to help you out? <laughs> I mean, wouldn't it be something every time you try to help God did it the wrong way, he kills you? Wouldn't that be something? My, how tender God has been good with most of us, huh? Now, you wouldn't think anybody God treated like that would ever say, Oh, I don't think I'll go today, you know, it's raining. Oh, same old stuff down there every Sunday. I'm getting tired of going. God's people are something else. There's something else. In spite of tokens of love. You know, you, I know you know God loves you, know all that kind of stuff. And those folks talking about love, they usually know a little bit about it than anybody else, less about it than anybody else. Talk about the love of God, the love of God. I know you know that God loves you. Christ died for you, all that kind of situation. But you know what we want? We always want something right now. We're like women. You know. <laughs> we always want a confirmation of it, you know. You know, wife says, oh, but you never tell me you love me. Oh, I love you. Shut up, you know. <laughs> a, woman, a woman says to her husband, will you love me when I'm old and ugly? Who said I don't love you? <laughs> Now, like I said, you're not going to get it on television. You're going to get it right here. That's where you're going to get it. 
And you take this thing right here, I mean, you know God loves you, and yet there have been times in your life, I'm certain, and there's certainly been times in my life when because of circumstances and the way God did things, you felt like it maybe didn't love you. Well, like maybe forsaken you. Maybe let you down. You felt that kind of stuff. And because of that, God from time to time, he lets a few handfuls of purpose fall your way to confirm his love. God does that. I've seen that. Uh, you wouldn't think anybody that, uh, uh, like I am, that God has been as good to as he's been to me would ever uh, give the Lord a hard time. Listen, I've seen, I've seen some things. I raised, I raised five kids by myself for 12 years without a mother. And my people cook meals for those kids four times a week. They're in the church, take them out to the church people to eat. And I go out and take a meeting like this, come back to the airport for 12 years, wonder why they're waiting for me. I got a taxi home by myself. And I'll come in off meeting like that and come back in there and come back home and feel kind of sorry for myself, you know, and pretty hungry, you know, so I'd stop my church's fried chicken and get me some chicken. They got any church's fried chicken out? That's, that's the chicken. You don't want to throw out Kentucky fried Colonel Sanders getting grease all over it. This uh, church's fried chicken, and I'd get that stuff and eat it and then come on home, and when I'd get home and open the door and come in there and be five covered dishes there, boy. Hot fried chicken, fried okra, rice. Biscuits, iced tea, and pecan pie sitting in the church. The Lord. I've come home, I've come home, and I've had, well, I've been gone some Christian day in the church. You knew I didn't have time to attend anything like that. Take the tires and rotate them on the car. I've come home, found the back room of my house, a whole new bookshelf built there. But some of you built it for me just for nothing. I know God's people are hard to get along with. I know they're cantankerous. I know a bunch of them are really ghosts. But you have a lot of God's people who love God and love the book. And they appreciate those who preach the book. And if you yeah. preach the book, they'll take care of you. Yeah. All you, they're always taking care of me. Always taking care of me. Now you think God treated a fellow like that, you, you wouldn't think he'd, you know, give the Lord a hard time. Now would you? You know, my first offering was, my first offering was, was $3.30. $3.30. That was for a meeting Saturday night and two meetings Sunday. $3.30. Just about enough money for gas to get up and back. Well, you know, I bought that money in the home and laid that money out there in the sink here at home, a little old trailer where I lived at that time, plywood trailer, and laid that thing down that plywood trailer, and I'll tell you, I was more proud of that money than any money I've ever earned since. I've been in a meeting where they gave me the offering in the four figures after the weekend, and I was never any more proud of that money than I was at $3.30. You know why? That was the first money I ever earned in my life doing what God told me to do. I'd earn money as a bartender and a dance band drummer, and a D.I. in the industry, and a sign painter, and a radio announcer, disc jockey, but never any money for doing what God told me to do. Three dollars and thirty cents. Well, you wouldn't think after that, after God had raised that adding up, you know, fifty to a hundred to two hundred to five hundred, eight hundred and up high on that, you wouldn't think if God treated a fellow like that, he'd ever get put out with the Lord, would you? Or disobey the Lord when the Lord said pray, or the Lord said witness. You wouldn't think I'd probably do a thing like that, would you? But he would. He would. It's a strange thing. We're prone to wander in spite of tenderness of instruction, in spite of tokens of love, and that is all, in spite of lessons learned. My wife says sometimes she gets to put out with the girls. You know, I've got, I've got, I've got three boys and four girls and five grandchildren, and coming up. Raising those kids, I, I know about kids, you know, man. I've, I've had to, I've, I think every church ought to have one Sunday where the men take care of the nursery. That's right. I mean, you learn something, man. You see how the other half lives. <laughs> and you take raising those kids, my wife gets put out. Well, I, I told them once, you got to keep telling them. Why should you have to keep telling them? Well, I told them twice. Tell them again, honey. Tell them again. I just told her yesterday. Tell her again. I don't see why I have to keep, but why does have God keep up telling us? Amen. You know, you learn a lot about yourself watching your kids. You have to tell that kid, don't do it. I told you, don't do it. I told you, don't do it. You kid, go ahead and do it, you know. Now, that, hadn't it that been true in your case? The Lord said, don't do it. 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 You want to ask it. Or else keep telling you. You know, men can get usually better and more results out than women can. It's the, it's the tone of voice, I guess, trying to make women live, make them equal. 
What a, what a stupid thing, man. I, you, you'd have to be educated to be that dumb. <laughs> you, think, you think men women are equal? Let's all pair off night and fight, okay, ladies, and see who, who wins. <laughs> men and women are equal. Why, you poor ladies here, you don't even have your, you don't even have a name. How many ladies are married? Let me see your hand. You ladies are married. You got your husband's name, don't you? How many are single? Let me see your hand. Why don't you got your father's name, don't you? <laughs> Stop. Equal. Oh, Stop. <laughs> don't even have a name, man. <laughs> <laughs> and you take you take women. Now, women love their kids. And honey, don't do it. And do that. And look at and look, that kid gets you figured out before he's ten years old. You take those kids to work, mom will just work her to death, you know. They know she loves them, and they know she tells them a hundred times she ain't going to do nothing about it. And old man turns them, well, I'll turn them up. I'd beat up my kids while I could, man. My kids are, <laughs> my kids are six feet, six feet one, and six two. Beat Mike and David. They're all chips off the old block. They're blocks off the old chip. <laughs> and those guys, I couldn't whip them out. I couldn't whip them out. The little one's six feet, 180 pounds. When I could, I did. <laughs> and I'll tell you, I'll just get that kid and say, Hey, kid, one more time. He'll stop. He'll stop. <laughs> I like that woman, like that woman trying to get a groupies, you know, and the kid hollering and screaming, raising king, you know, and screaming, hollering and screaming, hollering. Finally, a man had been watching, think about 50 minutes, a lady, could I say the word to your boy there for a minute? And she said, oh, yes, oh, thank you. I was just say something, anything would help. And went that little boy and bent down, called him aside, talked to him about, oh, about 15 seconds. And that kid behaved himself, never gave a peep the rest of the time, like out of the grocery store. And going out the front, the lady said, uh, what, to, I don't know what the word you said, that boy to straighten him out, but thank goodness you straightened him out. What did you say to him? He said, I said, that kid, you open your mouth again, I'll knock your teeth right through your throat. <laughs> <laughs> Not saying that'll get results. <laughs> Now, you know, God Almighty, God Almighty talks to us and tells us and then has to tell us again and again, and we forget. We forget. You know, the Oriental people are much better about that than Americans. I used to be a music officer of Radio Tokyo in Japan years and years ago. My job in the Army occupation was to censor all the Japanese music, get all the nationalistic elements out of it. I had an interpreter named Yokoi, and they'd go around and order all the... Uh, Kabuki dramas and all the light opera and opera and symphony and stuff, and all the nationalist comes out. And one time there, they're going to put on Handel's Messiah around Christmas time, and the head of the Tokyo Philharmonic, not the conductor, but the director, the, the businessman, came into that office just livid, just furious. He was a big chap. That guy was about six feet two, shoulders right out of his ears. He was a monster. <laughs> That's right. And he came in there, I'll cook him out, I'll cook him out, I'll cook him out, he's really gone. And I said to Yoko, I said, what's, what's the matter? What's wrong? And he said, well, and then Yoko explained it to me. And what happened was, when they gave him to pull on that Messiah, they'd invited a renegade Japanese fellow back from England that had stayed in England all during the war. Then he'd come back, and if he came back, he had an English wife with him, which didn't particularly help his testimony in Japan. Any. And these Japanese fellows were going to strike. They weren't going to play. And Arima had all the signatures, that Tokyo Philharmonic on there. He had about 70 signatures, and they weren't going to play. Well, General MacArthur had GHQ across the way there, and Daiichi Bill, and all those big shots around, all the Allied command was going to be there, and they weren't going to play. <laughs> and I said, well, man, it's Army occupation. you got orders you have to play. But I did. I, I wasn't born yesterday. You can't make a musician play right. You can't order a musician to play right. He can, boy, he can make the biggest mess you ever saw. And I said, well, I'll go to Bax for you, but I don't think nothing I can do. And he said, well, will you talk to Major so-and-so? So I went over there in our officer and talked to him, talked to a bunch of others, and I, I went out of the way to try to fix things up. and never got nothing done. But they still let the car come and direct. And I said to Yoko, I said, well, if he can direct music, that's one thing. I said, maybe they may not like him personally, but if he's a good director, they ought to be able to put up with him. And Yoko said, he no direct, Lieutenant. He, he cannot... He, 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 he go, what you call, he go, he go, what you call, I said, metronome. He said, you metronome. He go that way. <laughs> he meant all that guy could do was beat time. He couldn't do any directing. Well, I didn't do any good. But I went out left and came on back to the States. And you know something? When I got back to the States every Christmas for 10 years, I'd get a 
card from Tokyo. And it say, Never forget your kindness, Arima Song. Oh, let me say Japanese, thanking me for trying to help him out. Never forget your kindness. That puts me under conviction. You never forget his kindness, will you? Some of your memory hasn't been very long, has it? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. We're prone to backsliding in spite of lessons learned. And that isn't all. And that isn't all. We're prone to wander in, in spite of repeated discipline. It's a sad fact, but it's so that some of God's people just take a beating all their life. Well, they wouldn't have to take it. they just settle down and do what's right. And uh, I've come to a conclusion about these things. You know, when I got saved, when I got saved, I thought I was a pretty tough character. But I've, I've changed my mind through the years. And I've seen my, wa- my mind from knowing Christians and watching Christians. I've now I've seen some people. You know what? When I when I bang my head going through a door, I begin to wonder if I wasn't thinking something wrong when I got my head hit. <laughs> but some of God's people, I mean, what they go through, man, and never get the message, just beats the fire out of me, man. I can't understand it. I've seen God's people just take. I know one character I know that God called to preach, and the Lord took his wife and two out of three children before he surrendered, and he finally surrendered. On the death of the second child. I can't even imagine that kind of thing. Tough. Tough, boy. Tough. Too tough for your own good. Down there, back in the south Alabama, there's a place called Florala, and another place near called Andalusia. We're back in the Rattlesnake country, southeast Alabama, around Oop and Red Level and places back in there. And two fellows got in a fight back there. Name one fellow was Teal, name other fellow was Cato. They were bootleggers, and cussers, and whiskey drinkers, gamblers, you know, whoremongers, oh, you, you, you name it, they, they were it. And uh, they got in a big fight back there, and they'd been in fights before, but this night was a bad one. And Cato knocked Teal a flat, thought he had him knocked out, turned around and walked away from him. Teal reached down his boot and pulled out a boot knife, and came up behind him and reached down under him and stuck him in the gut and ripped his intestines clean across. I mean, he was holding his intestines and didn't go to the hospital. He grabbed his stomach, turned around, and knocked Teal out cold, and then went to the hospital. When he got to the hospital holding his insides then, he had peritonitis in the intestines and was dying. And I went to the hospital to talk to those two fellows about the soul. And I got in there, went over next to, went over to Teal's room and talked with him and led him to Christ. He got saved. He was about 22 years old. Went over to Cato. He was about 25 years old, lying on the bed, talking, and he wouldn't get saved. He lined down, must have done within 30 minutes, and he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't receive Christ. And I kept on and on, finally about gave up. And I just sat there looking at him. He was lying there sweating, and sweating all over the bed sheet. At that time, he didn't know whether he was going to make it or not. And finally, I said to him, I said, Cato, I said, let me ask you something. I said, what's that scar there in your forehead? He said, shrapnel in Korea about three years ago. I said, what's that? Place down above the banding. You know, she got a scar there in your chest above with the banding. Well, what's that? He said, knife fight when I was 10 years old. I said, boy, haven't you got any sense? Haven't you got no sense? I said, don't you know God's after you? Don't you know God's going to get you? If God goes out in much trouble to get you, you ain't seen nothing yet. You wait till you get out of here. My big old Paul crept down that sheet next to my hand, grabbed all of my hand. That old boy closed his eyes and prayed and asked the Lord to save me. And listen. I'd like to end it right there, and it'd have been a happy ending. But you know, uh, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. And you take old Cato, he got out of that place and joined the church and got baptized, lived for the Lord for about two years, and got back with the old crowd, quit reading his Bible, quit praying, got back with the old crowd again. Old crowd's always around, you know, they're out there. Some of you fellows saved in San Diego, they're out there. You know where they are. You know where they are right now. You just get bitter and mad at God, and you go around and look him up. The old kid, he went around and looked him up. And he got a hold of him there, went back in his own way, old ways, and I didn't hear nothing about him, uh, nothing from him for 15 years. And 15 years later, a uh, fellow came to me over in Pensacola, where I was pastor, and he said, uh, you know that fellow you led to Christ years ago? What was his name? I said, well, who do you mean? He said, well, then lose you. said, he got in a knife fight or something. I said, Cato, Cato. He said, yeah. He's down at the hospital. I said, you sure it's the same one? He said, well, I don't know. They say he's man Malusia. And he's a big old fellow, big rough-looking fellow. I said, well, uh, what happened to him? 
And the fellow said, well, he said he was messing around with somebody's wife out here in a bar, and the guy went home and got a shotgun, came back and shot him, took the sign of his face, blew his ear off, part of his jaw, his sinuses, <laughs> he's down there about half dead in the hospital. So I went down and dealed with him. And I got down there and came into the hospital and went upstairs, looked in the bed up there, and there he was, all bandaged up, head all bandaged up over on this side, half jaw shot away here, gone like right mess. And it was Cato. And I said, how you doing, Cato? He said, oh, pretty good. I said, who are you? I said, uh, you still got that scar on that bandage up in your forehead where the shrapnel got you in Korea? And he said, who are you anyway? And I said, you still got that scar down your belly where Tio cut you open the knife back there about 12 years ago? I thought he was going to have a heart attack. He turned the white of those bandages. He came up that bed and said, who are you? And I said, you still got that place down there? You got in the knife fight and you're 10 years old? I thought about telling him he might think I was one of the angels who come down the war and lot to get out of Sodom or something. And I said, I'm the preacher who led you to Christ about 12 years ago down there in Andalusia. And then he sank back in the bed. Oh, yeah, well, how you doing, preacher? I said, okay, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing okay. That's them Southerners. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm doing fine. How you doing? Got my head shot away. How you doing? I'll tell you that. <laughs> and I said, and I said, you don't look like you're doing so well. <laughs> and he said, well, preacher, he said, I ain't doing so well. I've been backslidden, he said, but I'm going to lift the Lord and I get out of here. <laughs> well, I hope so. <laughs> You say, did he? I haven't heard from him now for a while. I guess he's staying clean. I don't know. Isn't it a shame the Lord have to put a fellow through something like that to get him right? Some of the Lord's people are tough, boy, they're tough. Prone to wander, the Lord, I feel it, in spite of what? In spite of repeated discipline. God is sometimes taking you, almost tearing your head off before you get the message. All right, now you take you take those things. What are the signs? Let's look at it this way. What are the signs of being backslidden? How do you know when you're backslidden when you're not? Well, there are certain ways you can know. One of the ways you can know is by a loss of enjoyment without a loss of ritual. That is, you go right through the motions and attend in church and have the piano there and have the organ there, you know, and sing the hymns and take up the offering and go through the handshake and all that, but you don't enjoy it. You lost the joy. Lost the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. All over America you find congregations like that. You talk about heaven, their face doesn't light up. So they look at you like a tree full of owls. They got all the joy down here. You lose the joy. And you take, you take, uh, you take this. You lose spirituality without losing standards. Now I believe in standards, especially if you have a school, you've got to have some standards. I believe in all that kind of thing. But you cannot counterfeit spirituality. we got a thing going on in this country where if you have a blue sidewalk for the boys, the pink sidewalk for the girls, nobody comes close than three inches, and nobody smokes, and nobody drinks, everybody got a hair cut up above the collar, they're going to be spiritual. There'll be nothing but a bunch of whitewashed Pharisees if they're not spiritual. Let me tell you, secondary separation. Ah, your foot. Let me tell you something. The most separated people not New Testament were who? Right, the people that killed Jesus Christ. Don't waste my time. I've got a book. I know what I'm reading. I know what's going on. You can't make somebody spiritual, but they're saying, don't do this and don't do that, and do, do this and do that. I'm not saying some of those things aren't necessary, but they won't produce spiritual people. You'll get them to a whitewashed, self-righteous pig is all you get out of that kind of mess. Tell these girls, well, don't wear slacks, no slacks at all. We're going to have them to wear dresses when they put a softball off these pants? How about they turn over the canoe? What are you going to do then? <laughs> Listen, I've seen all this stuff. Don't, don't, don't you waste my time, man. I'm an old dog. I've been around for years. You, you'll take a time to get a lap on me. I know what's going on. You tell them, no, be sure. Tell them to wear dresses. You want know to do? They'll wear them up above the knees. You saw I put them down the knees. Okay, they'll wear, they'll wear them tighter than a scuba diver. <laughs> Okay, you make them loose. Okay, there was so thin a mosquito could fly through that bus in the wing. Listen, 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 listen. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. The only way you get spiritual girls and spiritual women is for those women and girls to fall in love with the Lord Jesus Christ and stay in love with Him. 
how to fix their clothes. Amen, amen, amen. All this business. We've, you know what we've learned how to do? We've learned how to, we've learned how to produce the, imitate the fruit of spirituality.